Welcome once again into the Radiopedia reading room for another week, a podcast unconcerned with books or poetry, tea leaves or palmistry. It's a radiology podcast, mate. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me to share his moderate to severe opinions on everything, it's my co-host, Frank Gaylard. Hello, Andrew. Yes, I think having at least moderate opinions on pretty much everything (laughs) is really important. It's much better than not having an opinion, but you have to remember that you have to be willing to change your opinion (laughs) and do so frequently and preferably unexpectedly just to keep people on their toes. Yeah, I did think about just saying severe opinions on everything, but I thought I'd be generous and say moderate. (laughs) (laughs) So today we have our second ever readful episode. Mm -hmm. Um, Very positive feedback about the first one I did with Matt Morgan on renal cell carcinoma. People seem to enjoy that. So I thought we'd uh, we'd go for it again. If you missed that, the idea of a readful episode is that I read a Radiopedia article word for word to an expert and I try to extract their thoughts and insights along the way. Um, I've got quite a few planned out for the future, which is good. Um, But this one is actually a bit different to the first one because instead of reading a Radiopedia article today, Frank, I'm going to read a tweetorial. Okay. And for those who don't know what a tweetorial is, uh, possibly you, Frank, it's like a, a series <laughs> of tweets that someone authors to guide you through a topic. And if you don't know what a tweet is, possibly you, <laughs> Frank, <laughs> then don't listen to this episode. Um, so I know you have switched off a lot from Twitter, Frank, but have you come across any neuroradiology tweets by at Teach Play Grub? Yes, they're the cartoon Yes. Tutorial ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. I won't say her actual name because that comes up first thing okay. in this read. Oh, that should be interesting. So she's been tweeting out some phenomenal teaching. So I reached out to her. I picked one of her tutorials to convert into a readful, and she kindly agreed to join me for a chat. Uh, I think we'll just get straight into it, Frank, because um, I'm keen for you to listen and mm-hmm. let me know what you think, and then we can chat more in the outro. So here we go. A tweetful readful. <laughs> Joining me today in the reading room, all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, it's, oh, hang on, we can't start there because I haven't asked you how to pronounce your surname. Okay, yeah, so so my first name is actually Lee, not Leah. It's spelled Leah, but it's, okay. it's Lee, and it's supposed to be Al Hilali, like Al Jazeera. It should have been hyphenated, but... For many years, I dreamed of marrying a man with a nice name like Smith or Jones. Um, but I married um, a Persian man whose last name is Fakhran, and I was like, well, you know, it's not all that much better. So I just left it. Joining me today in the reading room, all the way from Phoenix, Arizona, it's Lee Al Halali. Is that all right? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, good. We're keeping all this in, by the way. I'm not editing all that out. Um, I'm very excited <laughs> to have you on the podcast. How are you doing? Great, great. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Um, I've been listening to your podcast, so it's, it's, just, it's just awesome. I'm not sure that anyone else has, so that's good yeah. to know one person is. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure you don't need any uh, introduction for radiologists who are on Twitter. They all know who you are because of your uh, sensational neuroradiology tweetorials that you've been creating. Uh, they really are educational masterpieces. And your Twitter handle is at teachplaygrub. Does that have an origin story? What does that mean? Yeah, that was uh, really a mistake. (laughs) So (laughs) I hadn't really expected this whole Twitter thing to take off. I was like, I'm just going to go on there. I'm going to post some educational material for like the fellows and the residents. And and I thought teach, play, grab. It was supposed to be like a joke on eat, pray, love. That's what I was thinking. And so I was like, oh, this sounds really cute and it sounds really great in your head. This is why I think before like brands go national and things like that, they have like focus groups because like in my head, it sounded like a good idea, but no one knows what it's about. Does the grub mean like food? Sometimes we call that food in Australia. Yes. So I had imagined that I would kind of make a mix out of like, you know, uh, teaching. I do a lot of traveling, travel photos. I like to eat, things like that. But it's interesting because one of the things I've learned about Twitter is that when people follow someone, they follow them for a reason. Like you add a little something to their, you know, mm-hmm. timeline. The way I kind of describe it is it's kind of like there's lots of little shops on Twitter and you get certain things from certain shops. For me, people want educational content. 
they're not interested in my travel photos. So all of that kind of uh, got dropped very quickly. I, I do want to have a uh, burner account so I can go on there and say things that <laughs> I want to, you know, because when you're, you know, a lot of followers, every time you do anything, it broadcasts it to, to everybody. I'm always jealous of those, those anonymous kind of radiology ones that are out there who can say outrageous things and get away with it. Correct. I kind of like to have one of those as well. Um, let's continue on. So over the last 12 months or so, you produced a whole bunch of neuroradiology themed tutorials. So I thought as a bit of a challenge, I might choose one of them and try to turn it into a readful episode of the podcast. And so that's what we're about to do. Uh, so the one I've selected, Lee, is cervical canal stenosis, a topic that I hope will be relevant to a lot of people out there and hopefully not too hard to explain without images to assist us. Um, out of interest, do you pronounce it cervical or cervical, Lee? <laughs> um, so um, I'm originally uh, from Texas. So then it's uh -huh. cervical with the cer cervical. Cervical, yeah. Um, now I'm literally going to read these tweets out to you, Lee. There's a natural break point in the middle of the tweet or where we'll uh, take a quick pause and maybe talk about a few other things. And then at the end, I'd also like to have a general chat about cervical spine MRI reporting. But for now, let's get into the tweets. How does that sound? Sounds great. Tweet number one. Have disagreements between radiologists on the degree of cervical canal stenosis become a pain in the neck for you? Here's a tutorial on cervical canal stenosis grading that's easy to remember, reproducible, and evidence-based. So that's tweet number one. And then you've got a little picture of a slide, which is kind of like a teaser for what's to come. You, you got to have something to, to grab uh, the attention, right? You, it's, all, it's all about clickbait, right? <laughs> <laughs> tweet number two. In the lumbar spine, it's all about the degree of canal narrowing and room for the nerve roots. In the cervical spine, we have another factor to think about, the cord. Cord integrity is key, no matter the degree of canal stenosis. If the cord isn't happy, the patient won't be happy either. Now you went for isn't rather than ain't. You would have been tempted to say, if the cord ain't happy, the patient won't be either. Right, right. Going going back to my, my roots. <laughs> I promise I won't do any more accents. That's, that's the last one. So for this one, the slide has uh, two issues for the cervical spine and then has a picture of canal narrowing, which is an issue of space. And then the second issue, which is the effect on the cord. And this tutorial is really about separating those two things out, the bony canal uh, and the effect on the cord. And you have an emoji scale on the side, a green smiley face at the top, and then a sad uh, red face at the bottom. I do love an emoji scale. I wish we could incorporate those into our radiology reports. <laughs> right, right. You know, like, for example, on, you know, tumor progression, you know, no tumor progression is a smiley face. We're not quite sure. You probably need some perfusion. It's kind of got the in-between sign. And then, like, it's clearly progressed, the sad face. Yeah. There. <laughs> Tweet number three, so cord flattening, even without canal stenosis, can cause myelopathy. No one is quite sure why. Some say it's because mass effect on static imaging may be much worse in dynamic positions. Some say it's repetitive micro trauma, and some say it's micro ischemia from compression of perforator vessels. So I think this is a really, really key point, isn't it? You don't need to actually see compression of the cord at the time of your scan for the patient to develop a compressive myelopathy. And you have a picture here, you've got some little hammers banging on the cord to represent micro trauma. And then you've got a fist pushing on the vessels and compressing those perforator vessels and maybe leading to some kind of ischemic process. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, one of the really important points of the tutorial is we're always talking about canal stenosis, and that's what I think a lot of, like, trainees focus on. But the importance of the effect on the cord is important to surgeons. I would always tell my fellows the story that, you know, when I was at the University of Pittsburgh, there was this neurosurgeon who will go unnamed, uh, who was the biggest producer for the entirety of the U University of Pittsburgh health system. And he would operate on everybody. Like if you couldn't come to his office, he would like drive to the highway on the side of the road to like examine <laughs> you so that he, this is a true story that patients would tell us, uh, so that he could get you as his patient. And we did a myelogram on one of his patients and I said there was some cord flattening and he came down and he was like, are, 
are you sure? Because, you know, if, if you say that there's cord flattening on this Milo, I'm going to go ahead and take this person to the OR, you know? And I was like, oh my God, he's mm. pausing about operating on someone. I, I I thought that, you know, he would operate on anyone, you know, he wouldn't operate on the side of the road, but he'd find you on the side of the road. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I think it is. And and that was it. And the patient went to the OR, you know, because they were myelopathic and they had cord flattening. So um, I think that that's a really important point that, you know, I don't think it's stressed enough. Yeah. Tweet number four, and this is where we start to get into the first kind of classification system. So it says, let's start with canal stenosis. Measurements have been proposed, example, uh, less than 10 millimeters, but this is cumbersome and introduces reader variability. It is better to think functionally. The cord swims in CSF like a fish in water. Like a fish, it needs room to swim. How much room there is in the fish bowl determines the degree of stenosis. So you've introduced the first of your little analogies here, the, the fish in the bowl. It's a kind of a constant theme through majority of your tutorials is these kind of analogies that are, that are fantastic. How do you come up with them? You know, um, it's how I think about things, you know, like how I understand it conceptually. Like I literally am like, okay, well, it's like, you know, you're swimming in a pool and you need room to swim. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, we'll make it a fish. And that's kind of how I personally understand these concepts. And I have found that, you know, um, if you can find something that's cute and funny and make people laugh, then, <laughs> then they'll remember it better. And I like to say, if I can make you laugh, I can make you learn. It's a good theory. And uh, I like in the bowl. He is cute. Thank you. He was a lot of fun to draw. <laughs> we tend to think, well, you know, measurements always have to be better because they're more exact. But I think to anyone who's been in clinical practice, you know, you can make the measurement what you want. You need to be like, oh, you know, I, I think it's enlarged and it's not quite there. And you're like, well, I can actually measure it just like this, you know, and, and I think that it, it, it introduces a, a degree of variability. And I, and I think that, you know, if you're looking to find a way to read something that's reproducible using visual cues rather than, um, you know, measurements, I think it's a better way to get people to be on the, the same page. Being able to think about it functionally, being able to think about like what physiologically is happening is, is a much better way to do it. Yeah. Tweet number five, mild stenosis is when your fishbowl decorations take up one side of the bowl. Not great, but our fish can still swim. Moderate stenosis means your decorations take up both sides of the bowl. Swimming is really affected. And severe stenosis means you went all out with the decorations and there isn't any more room in the bowl for the fish. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so that's the way, you know, you should, you should think about it is you have a bowl. Um, and I think of degenerative change as kind of like the decorations in the bowl. There are unnecessary things that your body puts in there that your cervical spine probably or your cervical cord probably doesn't really want. Just like the fish isn't really interested in having a castle in his bowl. He wants the room. Yeah. If you take up one side, a face the ventral, that's mild. Both sides, then that's moderate. And then when you completely crowd it out and you squish the little fish or the cord, then that's severe. So that's what you say in the next tweet, actually. So the sides of the fish bowl are the ventral and the dorsal. CSF, so mild canal stenosis, is when either the ventral or the dorsal CSF is effaced, but the other side of the fishbowl is still empty. Not ideal, but our fish can still swim around. And then tweet number seven, the moderate canal stenosis, you have both sides of the fishbowl uh, that are filled, so both the ventral and the dorsal CSF have been effaced. Now the room to swim has been notably limited. And then tweet eight, finally, in severe canal stenosis, the bowl is completely filled too much decoration and no CSF is seen. There is no room for the fish in this scenario. Similarly, there is no room for the cord and it is compressed. Not only is there no swimming, the fish has been crushed. <laughs> so yeah, no, it, it was a lot of fun to, to, to draw. The, the whole idea is that it's a concept that people can understand having enough room in the water to swim around. That's what the cord needs. It needs fluid around it. And um, how much is it? It's attenuated. It's easy to see. It's reproducible. And as I tell my fellows, if you are having to make measurements, then you've lost. <laughs> and not only that, but this is also evidence based as well. So the next tweet talks about that. Uh, so tweet nine, this classification system is to all other classifications like a goldfish is to all other pets. It's super easy 
and simple. It's also evidence-based. It's the Muller classification. It has excellent reproducibility. It hasn't been correlated with pain, but it's been correlated with SSEPs and outcomes. SSEP meaning somatosensory evoked potentials. And then you have a couple of references on your slide. Absolutely. I mean, I feel that there's not always one right way to do things in medicine, but as long as you're do what you're doing is evidence-based, then I think that you have a, a strong justification for it. And I think that's incredibly important in something like spine, where there is a lot of subjectivity, a lack of correlation between clinical symptoms and what you're seeing on imaging. I tell my fellows, you know, after you've been in medicine for a while, the, the, the draw of anecdotal medicine is strong. We're like, oh, I've seen that. It's definitely severe. And you have to, you have to resist that. What is supported in the literature? What has been proven? What has been clinically correlated? And that was what was important to me when all of these tweets that you see, they're tweets that I not only use for education of others, but they're education for myself too. When I'm sitting down, I'm like, okay, I need a way that I'm going to read these cervical spines where I'm not measuring everything, but I can't just be like, oh, you know, I, I see all these, you know, uh, C-spines all, I know when it's really bad, I know when it's really good, but what does the evidence say correlates with clinical symptoms, with clinical outcomes, and, and use that? I always say you kind of get a lot of information out of it yourself by putting together a talk, and I think it's absolutely correct. I mean, you know, a, a lot of the talks that I've done over the years, the facts that I remember from those I use in day-to-day -day practice. And if I hadn't done those talks, I probably wouldn't be aware of them because you know, just listening to other people talk is sometimes not enough. You have to actually actively do it yourself and practice it. I, I completely agree. That's something I love about education is it makes you a, a better radiologist as well. And that's why I always love teaching fellows. Their questions challenge you and force you to learn things. I say it's kind of like that movie, As Good As It Gets, that Jack Nicholson movie, you know, where, yeah, yeah, yeah. where he says to um, Helen Hunt, he's like, you make me want to be a better man. And it's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's the best. And, and it, but that's what I think teaching is. They make me want to be a better radiologist. So this is actually kind of the break point in this tutorial. We've covered the you know, spinal canal, the bony canal, uh, stenosis, and we're going to move on to talk about the cord after this. We'll probably chat about more of this later, but when you report cervical canal stenosis, do you specify in your report what is contributing to the stenosis? For example, ligamentum flavum hypertrophy, disc osteophyte complex, it's probably a can of worms, that term. Um, but do you specifically state what is causing the mild or moderate stenosis? Um, yeah, absolutely, because that will clearly um, affect the, the surgeon's approach. So, you know, if it's going to be, especially if it's densely calcified, uh, disc osteophyte complex, well, that will probably preclude them from being from doing, you know, an ACDF and they have to do a uh, posterior approach. Um, so I think saying what you think is causing it is absolutely important for them to be able to, to make the appropriate surgical treatment decisions. That's what I was hoping you, you would say, because when I sit in the, the spine meeting, I took one recently, most of the decision-making there is, uh, well, firstly, which levels to operate at, but also front versus back. Um, that's kind of a key decision-making process. And so therefore describing what is producing that canal stenosis is the key for them to be able to decide uh, how they're going to approach it. Um, I've got some random questions that we kind of throw in to these podcasts. I like the way you're, you're approaching this. So I'm going to give you some of the more tricky ones, if that's all right. Okay. Um, so this one is name the time you laughed the hardest. Now this doesn't need to be funny. Um, often it's a time where you laughed inappropriately, like it, you weren't supposed to laugh, but you just couldn't stop yourself like at a funeral or whatever. Have you got an example of that? So I, yeah, you know, I was thinking about, cause when you, I was listening to your podcast where you were answering your own time and I was thinking about all the times <laughs> all, we all, everyone who's been in medicine long enough has the story about they, they did something that was not quite appropriate uh, for medicine. Um, and <laughs> I remember when I was a medical student on neurology, we had this woman and she was having what looked like catat like absence catatonic seizures. And she would just be staring out into space and doing nothing. Um, but one time, actually, she was having one of these, quote, seizures. And we brought her, we even did an EEG, and there was, like, nothing. So we kind of had a feeling it was, you know, pseudo-seizures. And 
Um, and so I was, she was my patient. And every time I would round on her in the morning, she would be in her little absence state. And I couldn't get an exam. And um, so then when we come back later for rounds, the attending would be like, what did you see? And I'd be like, yeah, well, she was, you know, having a little seizure. I didn't get an exam. And, and she, they, she was making me look awful on rounds, right? So I came in one morning and she was doing her little absence seizure. And I leaned down next to her and I whispered in her ear and I was like, everyone <laughs> knows you're faking it. Because I figured that if she wasn't faking it and was having a seizure, she wouldn't hear me. Um, and she never had another seizure and we discharged oh, really? her the next day. Yes. And, um, I think that story tells you why I don't do patient care and why I'm a radiologist now. So I love it. I love it. It's a, it's a recognized clinical test, surely whispering in the ear like that. <laughs> the other one I've got here is how would your parents describe what you do? You know, it's funny um, because I, I had originally gone to um, school, I think like a lot of people in med school thinking that they were going to be a, a surgeon. Um, mm -hmm. But um, my surgery rotation pretty much beat that out of me. Um, and so I decided to be a radiologist. And um, I remember when I was a resident, we were um, all over for Christmas. And uh, my brother-in-law said to me, he's like, you know, Lee, I've decided I want to be a radiologist too. Like, well, um, Todd, uh, he hadn't graduated from high school and he was like 35 years old. So I'm like, well, I mean, you're gonna have to get your high school diploma. You're gonna have to do college. You're gonna have to do that's it's, it's a long time. And you're, you're, you're like 35. And he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't worry. I found a two-year program at the community college and I'll be a radiologist. And I was like, I love Todd. And I'm like, um, yeah, that, that's a radiologist, radiology tech. I'm, I'm a radiologist. I, I'm, I'm a doctor and like the blank stares from my family. <laughs> like, I was like, everyone thinks that I went to med school. I was like, nah, medicine's not for me. Nah. I'll be a tech. My, uh, my wife, so the wife of the podcast, she is a general practitioner and my, my kids like to say that she's a real doctor and that, I, <laughs> whereas I'm just a radiologist. So, you know, I'm not exactly going to argue with that. You know, <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, when you're on the plane and they're like, is there a doctor on board? You're like, not really, not yeah. really. They also say that because I go to work four days a week and she goes to work only two days a week, that she must get paid more because she doesn't have to go as much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's cute. I like that one. Um, we better get back into the tweetorial. Um, so tweet number 10. But canal stenosis isn't enough. Cord flattening can cause myelopathy regardless of the degree of canal stenosis. It's like being punched in the face. No matter how far away the hit comes from, it still hurts. Cord flattening is like being punched. It hurts even in mild canal stenosis. I love this analogy. And you've got a picture of a man getting punched by one of those boxing gloves on a spring like coming out and punching him in the face and says, no one likes getting punched in the face no matter how much room they give you. So I think that's important. Then you've got a picture, uh, an illustration, like an axial slice showing that there's you know, a little disc protrusion and it's pushing on the cord. There's, the canal is actually quite capacious overall. There's lots of CSF around the cord, but focally in the center, you've got the disc touching the cord and that's the important thing. Tweet 11, think of the canal like a parking space. Even if no one encroaches on your space, if someone opens their door and dings your car, your car is still damaged and you are still mad. Your parking space may still be wide open, but you still have a nick in your door. And then you've got a picture here of car spaces and the doors slamming into each other. I feel like you had two analogies here. You had you had the boxing glove being punched from a distance and then you had the car spaces and you thought, I love them both. I'm going to keep them both in. Um, you know, I could say that, you know, Andrew, I just really wanted to emphasize the point, but, yeah. what, but what had happened was I, I originally went with the car and I, and I drew it and I'm like, you know, I think it's just, it, it's like essentially like being punched in the face, you know? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I like that better, but I was like, oh, but I spent so much time drawing spent these cars. So time. <laughs> but yeah, I included them both. Speaking of time, when I asked people on Twitter, for questions to ask you, the number one was, how do you find the time to put these together? Because there's so much detail in the illustrations. It's probably not coming across in the audio, but there's a huge amount of detail in these illustrations. How do you find the time? 
Um, it, it's a lot of work. Um, it helps that a lot of these come from lectures that I've already researched that I give the fellows. So I don't have to do a lot of the, the background reading. The, the illustrations, they can take a lot of time. Um, the more I've done these, the easier it's gotten because I can steal other illustrations from earlier yeah. tutorials. Um, you'll find that the, you know, dad bod guy, the bald guy with the big belly, there's so many things that look like him in like the brain. I use him over and over um, again. But I, I mean, I really enjoy doing the, the drawings. It's, it's kind of relaxing for me. Uh, you know, like maybe other people like knit or run or, you know, thing, like it, it just, uh, you yeah. know, it's kind of, it's very relaxing for me to just kind of have fun and, uh, and, and draw these uh, things. The one thing I'll say though, being on Twitter and putting these things out there, when you're giving a talk to fellows and you've researched it and you've read like, you know, three or four reviews and you're like, okay, I understand this topic and I'm going to give it. Um, when you give it on Twitter, there is always somehow the f it gets into the feed of the expert on this topic yeah. who does nothing but their research on it. And so even now, now that I have like a wider audience, even things that I've previously prepared for fellows, I will go back and I will read six other papers because, because you're, you're, you're generally reaching like all of these incredibly experts who know the nuances of it that, that you don't as a radiologist when it comes to the clinical side. Yeah, you're putting yourself out there and how do you deal with that when you get feedback and maybe somebody disagrees with with something you've, you've said? I know you deal with it really, really well. I've seen your replies in comments. You reply to everyone and, and are very open with the whole thing. Um, but does it ever get you down, that kind of thing? No, I mean, I think it's an opportunity to learn. You, you know, post something on Dementa and like this world's expert who does research in Alzheimer's, like, well, actually, you know, if you look at where the tau is being deposited, you know, and you're like, oh, wow. okay, well, thanks. I, I didn't know that, you know, I only have like 15 tweets, you know, it's not going to yeah. be a comprehensive thing. And, and other people will bring out the nuances that, that sometimes get missed. Sometimes teaching doesn't have to be hundred percent perfect. And what you're teaching is a heuristic that is correct most of the time and helps you to remember and helps you to put out better reports. And even if it's not a hundred percent perfect, it's still way, way better than having no knowledge. You know, that's something that I think about when I, when I do a talk, when you get a bit of that imposter syndrome, it's kind of like, no, no, I, you know, I might not know everything about this topic, but I think I've got a reasonable approach that will help other people in their approach. So how long does it take to do some of these drawings? It depends. I, I hate to say it, but I love to do vascular things because vessels are so super easy. Those can maybe take like, you know, three or four hours to do like a, a good vascular anatomy tutorial. It still sounds long to me. <laughs> and in the process of drawing it, it really also helps you to remember it as well. But some of them can take um, even longer, um, especially if they have like really complex ones. Uh, people are not my strong point and hence why everyone doesn't have a face because my faces are, they take too much time. Are you now feeling pressure to keep making more and is that is that weighing you down at all like i know that even just putting out a podcast every week you know once you start off you're like oh yeah that's easy once a week and then you're like oh i better make sure i've got more guests coming along um is that is that pressure is something you feel it is. I'm going to be honest with you, but it's it's a good pressure and that, you know, I have people coming up and to me at conferences and messaging me being like, I learned so much from you. You've been so helpful. I'm so excited for your next tutorial. And it's a pressure, you know, like you want to do well for these people. You want to help them. You want to do things for them. It does make me, you know, feel like I need to be putting this stuff out. Uh, but you know, when I get all these comments, you know, saying how much, how helpful they are and things like that, it, it really makes it worthwhile. And, and that's, you know, why I do it. All right, better get back into the tweets. You ready? Tweet number 12. So cord flattening has three degrees. Either it's not there, it's there, or it's there and is so bad that it causes cord damage. Think of it like a fight. Cord deformity without signal is like someone pushing you to start a fight. You can still walk away. Cord deformity with signal is a punch to the face. It's on. Uh, so you've got the three grades uh, drawn here. So you've got grade one, and you said there's attenuation of the subarachnoid space. So the fecal sac is getting indented, um, but without any cord deformity. So the contour of the cord is maintained. Grade two, there's cord deformity, but no cord signal abnormality. And then Grade three, you've got double punch coming from the front and back here. It says cord deformity with cord signal abnormality. And then you've 
coloured the the cord red to indicate the compressive myelomalacia. Yeah, so it came from that idea that, you know, the idea that that you're getting punched. So it doesn't matter where you, it comes from, a punch hurts. Um, so I'd actually wanted to be like, oh, if if you're a hit, but you but you don't um, actually have myelomalacia yet. I wanted it to be like, oh, it's like you know Michael Jackson. You can still beat it, and I was going to draw like Michael Jackson, and <laughs> and you could still you could still walk away, you know. Um, you and can then, moonwalk away. Exactly. There were so many <laughs> possibilities, and um, and then you know if you actually have myelomalacia, I was going to show someone with a black eye that you know you got to stand up for yourself at that point, right? <laughs> And then your next tweet, tweet number 13, you have some examples. Uh, so you give the example of cord deformity without cord signal. That would be grade two, someone pushing and trying to start something. Cord deformity and cord signal, that would be grade three. The fight has already started and the cord already has a black eye. So you've got a couple of, uh, or one clinical example of that. And the important thing here is that in terms of our bony canal stenosis from the Muller classification that we learned earlier, there's only moderate canal stenosis. There's quite a bit of CSF still around this cord. But when you look at the cord itself, there's cord signal abnormality. So there is grade three according to assessing the cord. Um, and this is called Kang. We'll get to that later, but it's called the Kang classification. You ready for tweet number 14? I'm, t I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> okay, so tweet number 14, remember, this is independent of the degree of canal stenosis. You have cord deformity and signal even in lesser degrees of canal stenosis. Remember, cord flattening can cause cord damage regardless of the degree of canal stenosis. And this is the Kang system, tweet 15, and it was created to bring the idea of cord flattening into the rating of cervical spine stenosis since flattening slash deformity contribute to myelopathy regardless of stenosis. And then you've got a slide. So it has Kang classification system, high inter-observer agreement, higher grades are correlated with more symptoms of myelopathy, but not pain. And you've got a couple of references there, one from Kang and one from Park. We will share a link to the tweetorial in the show notes so people can have a look at these tweets as we're going through and see the references and things. Tweet number 16. Why don't we just use Kang and forget Muller? Well, the problem with Kang is that if there's no cord signal, many degrees of canal stenosis are equal. Here, and you've got some examples, both mild stenosis with flattening and severe stenosis with flattening are equal in Kang, but clearly one is much worse and more at risk. And you can see here, you've got in your picture, one with quite severe canal stenosis, according to the Muller system, but there's no cord signal. And so therefore it's a Kang to tweet number 17 we're almost at the end we're getting there tweet number 17 so we use both for every level we rate the degree of canal stenosis according to Muller and the degree of cord flattening according to Kang remember there is no perfect classification systems sometimes you need to combine and so you've got a summary picture here with we use both rating systems at every level and you've got the fishbowl analogy pictured for the Muller classification with the three degrees of canal stenosis and then you have the fists getting the cord again to demonstrate the importance of looking for the cord signal abnormality in the Kang system. And so final tweet, tweet 18. So remember both canal and cord matter in the cervical region. Degree of stenosis is important but even without it Cord flattening can have you swimming with the fishes. So hopefully you will take to these rating systems like a fish to water. End scene. Yeah. Excellent. You know, I people love those cheesy quotes, but having it read out loud to you is, is a little bit uh, embarrassing. But yeah. I was going to ask you, what's it like having your tweetorial read to you? Uh, so, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, I was talking with this neurologist who had done, um, you know, a, a, pod, a really successful podcast. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be on a radiology podcast. And he's like, so you're telling me that a specialty based entirely on imaging is going to talk about itself in a medium that has no imaging. And I was like, Yes. Yeah. And yeah. he was like, he's like, you're going to do a mime pod podcast next, you know, <laughs> like uh, that, that seems to also be something fitting for that medium. Uh, I think that he, he did a really great job. I, I hope it, it came across. Um, and I, I think that, you know, there's a lot to talk about in terms of, you know, how we, 
you know, rate things um, that doesn't require you to actually, you know, see the images. Yeah, let's finish off by talking about the actual day-to-day -day reporting of degenerative cervical spine MRI. I must admit that I don't specifically report Muller and Kang, and yet I kind of do because I combine elements of them into how I report each level. So for example, I might say C4-5, moderate canal stenosis due to circumferential disc bulge with flattening of the anterior cord, uh, normal cord signal is maintained. So in that, I'm kind of giving all the information that's required for, for Muller uh, and for Kang, but not really saying it. Do you do something similar or do you actually specify them? I I do not use the the name of the classification. Um, I the classifications I feel um, are meant to help you to be able to make an interpretation of the findings that you see. So you, you see, for example, both ventral and dorsal CSF effaced. What does that mean? How, what kind of degree of canal stenosis is that? How clinically significant is it? But I really am very much against actually stating the classification systems because they don't translate well out of radiology, you know? And mm -hmm. our purpose as a radiologist is to be able to, you know, communicate to our clinicians. And I think that if you just state a classification system that's something that's radiology-based and not something that's relevant to them, then, then you're not communicating. Um, I remember when I first started off and I was in private practice and I was calling modic changes of the end plates, right? I got a call from, you know, this PCP who was like, you know, oh my God, you said he had modic changes. Like, what does that mean? Does he need to go to the OR? You know, like, what? you know, like he had no idea. And that's when it occurred to me that, you know, things that may make you sound smart in your own head don't actually mm -hmm. make you sound smart at all to your clinician. They just make you sound uh, difficult and uh, to understand and confusing. And and if your point is to help your clinician, which is what the radiologist is there for, y you should always be trying to communicate. So now I just say edematous degenerative end plate changes and everyone knows what I'm talking about. That's what I say. Active end plate changes, degenerative end plate changes, right. or chronic appearing Exactly. Degenerative end plate changes. I mean, I used to work with a guy at Pittsburgh who loved to say, you know, like there was T2 prolongation here and T2 prolongation mm. here, you know, and, and that's meaningless to clinicians, you know, and I feel that, you know, our job is to be able to, to generally interpret the images, you know, what is a T2, is it chronic microvascular change, is it demyelinating, you know, say what you think it is. And that's something I always, you know, kind of uh, press to my fellows is, you know, make your report what you would say to your clinician if they were coming into the reading room to, to talk to you. And I think this kind of like beautifully ties back with the whole social media thing is that, you know, people, when for some reason, when you're communicating via writing to someone remotely, you become a different person. You know, um, and it's true on social media, people are saying like crazy things they would never say to anyone, you know, in person, like, mm -hmm. you know, these meek people are something like trying to start fights on like social media, like they would never do in person. Like road rage in, in the car. You know? Exactly. And I feel like that's almost something that's, that's true of, of radiology reports. Also, when you're not speaking to someone, you make a report that you would never say to them. Like, you know, I see these reports where people list like 15 differentials and I'm like, if someone came into the reading room and was like, what do you think, you know, this cord signal is, you wouldn't be like, hmm. let me list the 16 things that I Google, you know? No. And, and I think that- You'd be like, yeah, mate, it's just this. Exactly, exactly. And you would never say, oh, these are modic changes. You know, you'd be like, oh, there's some degenerative edema, you know, like, so, so I really try to, to emphasize that, you know, while we have these classification systems in order to help you make an informed you know, evidence-based decision on your interpretation, your actual report should be communicating what you understood, not just repeating and regurgitating back a classification system to your clinician. So even though we've learned about Muller and Kang, it's just important information to have knowledge and awareness that these classification systems exist. And then your report really just needs to incorporate them without necessarily uh, specifically referring to them. Um, foraminal stenosis is another, another topic altogether. In the lumbar spine, we report subarticular zone in addition to foraminal zone and extra foraminal zone. Do you do anything similar for the cervical spine or do you only refer to the foramen? You know, our job is to give the clinician as much information as possible to help them make their decision on treatment. So while there's not specifically a lateral recess because there isn't a exiting nerve root 
um, sleeve within the canal the way that there is in the lumbar spine, um, there still can be pathology in the lateral aspect of the canal and the cervical spine. So rather than saying like there's subarticular recess narrowing like there, like you would in the lumbar region, um, you can, especially if you have good images, you can actually see the anterior and posterior nerve rootlets coming off. Yeah. And so I'll say like, you know, there's, there's mass effect upon the anterior nerve rootlet, or if I can't see it, you know, if it's on a great image in the expected location of the anterior nerve rootlet, and then, you know, say that this could possibly be causing, you know, weakness and whatever uh, nerve that that is, if it's involving the anterior or possibly pain, if it's pos uh, mass effect on the dorsal uh, nerve rootlet. Yeah, I, I do very similar. I, I will use the term sometimes preforaminal. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, you know, left preforaminal stenosis contacting the anterior rootlet um, at specified level. And finally, I have a structure that I use for a standard cervical spine MRI report, but I wonder if you could quickly verbalize yours. Do you have like a general opening line or two that you always use? I actually free dictate all my spines. Um, I find mm -hmm. that there's too many things I would want to change um, in a template. And I generally do the the simple organization that I teach the residents, you know, A, B, C, D, alignment, B for bone marrow, C for cord, and then D, and then I go um, level by level. Um, I tend to go level by level, um, you know, in essentially every outpatient, you know, done for degenerative findings. When I first started being an attending, I was like, oh. I'm going to go level by level in everything because they paid for this, you know, CT trauma C-spine. And if I can see degenerative changes, I'd owe it to them to, you know, describe all these degenerative findings. And then one day you're like, you know, incredibly busy and you don't have time in this, you know, total spine for meds. And you're like, and there's overall mild degenerative findings without significant canal or foramenal narrowing and some mild cord flattening. And then no one says anything. And you realize the mm -hmm. whole time, no one cared. That's acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> no one cared. You you were you were speaking out into the void. Um, and so, you know, there are times where I won't go level by level, but um, I feel like if there's ever any doubt, you should always err towards, you know, going level by level, you know, and frankly, sometimes it's yeah. easier. If yeah. Sometimes when I don't go level by level, I get halfway through the report and then I regret it. I'm like, ah, oh, man, I should have just gone level by level. It would have been easier because uh, you're kind of jumping all over the place. In terms of opening lines, yeah, I do the same, you know, normal cervical vertebral alignment, no suspicious marrow signal abnormality, normal cord signal, no cord atrophy, something like that. I will comment on anything that's generalized for the MRI. So for example, something like posterior longitudinal ligament thickening or ossification of the PLL, I will kind of mention that up top just because it applies to so many levels. So I'll give the range for it. And then then I do more of a level by level assessment. So after you go level by level, is there anything else you include in the body of your report or did you finish with that? Um, so I, I like you will, yeah, I'll include like any sort of general um, finding, you know, like if there's some sort of abnormal marrow signal, you know, like you said, um, OPLL. Um, I also will start at the top with any like overall surgical changes because it's hard to kind of break the surgical mm -hmm. changes down level by level. It's better just to describe everything yeah. all at once and then talk about what the surgical changes have done at their specific level in the level by level. And then, you know, um, I basically will check my um, dorsal paraspinous soft tissues and, you know, check the intracranial contents and or the yeah. ab abdominal contents, you know, um, for the lower spine. The, the last few lines that I use in the body is really about triggering myself to look at check areas. So I'll say things like the vertebral artery flow voids are preserved, normal appearance of the visualized posterior cranial fossa structures or something like that. And it's really there for me <laughs> to make sure I remember to look at those things before I sign off the report. And then uh, when you get to the conclusion of your report, do you have any tips for how to formulate the conclusion? Um, it's kind of along the lines of what I was saying before is, you know, say what you would say to the clinician if they came into the room to ask you about the spine. I have a rule of uh, threes, right? So I have three main types of impressions that I do. One is there's nothing here. This spine is fine. Sp this, this spine is fine. You know, don't touch yeah. it. You know, and that, that for that, I'll give a general view, like overall mild gender findings without significant canal or neural cranial narrowing. And then the other end of the spectrum is where it's horrible. And there are about 15,000 things that could be causing their pain. You can operate all day. This person's not going to get better. And for that, I will also give a general overview, like, you know, overall advanced degenerative mm -hmm. findings with multi-level severe canal stenosis, you know. And then in between, I will try, by in between uh, 
uh, impression is, what do I think is causing their pain? And I will list up to three things that I think might be causing their pain. Because I feel like once you've gotten more than three, well, then, then you're back in the, I don't know what's causing it. There's so many different things sort of impression and you need a general impression. So I think that's, that's one thing that's really incredibly important in spine imaging is to try to look as much as what they're clinically saying um, their pain is um, and where it's happening. There's so much that you see in a spine MRI to try to figure out for your clinician which you think are the most likely culprits, I think is the, the thing that you can do to help them the most. That's what I was hoping you'd say, the, the impression of the report. It really is the bit where I look back at the clinical history and go, all right, they've got right arm um, radiculopathy. How does that relate to what I'm seeing on the scan? Can I potentially specify a level that's involved? Of all the findings that I've listed in the body of report, which ones of them actually relate to the, the clinical presentation and therefore are the ones that I'm going to going to highlight. You, you can't just be listing everything that you've specified for every level because most of it is irrelevant in most clinical situations. I think that's all the questions I uh, had for you, Lee. I'll accept two, two quick questions okay. actually to finish off. Can you come back, please, 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 and we'll do another one of your tweetorials at some I would stage. love to. Um, no, I would, I would, uh, this is, this actually just, it's really been a lot of fun. Cause I was looking through a list of them and there were quite a few that I would have, I would have chosen. And I was like, oh, I've got to settle on one. All right. I'll start with cervical spine, but I would love to do more. So that was the first question. Please come back. And two, Frank and I are making a reading room Spotify playlist with the help of our guests. So the question is, do you listen to music while you report? And if so, have you got a recommendation for us? Um, so I do have a recommendation, but it's not for the reason that you think. I don't listen to music when I when I read, um, and it's because you know going back to this theme of my traumatic uh, time on surgery as a medical student. We used to have music playing in the OR, and so when I hear music playing when I'm working, I'm like transformed back to the OR, where I'm just like, oh my god, how much long do I have to stand Post -traumatic here? Post-traumatic stress. Exactly. The, the retractor, I'm, I'm not pulling hard enough, you know, um, that, that kind of, <laughs> and um, it's funny because when I was on general surgery, my senior would always play Counting Crow's Big Yellow Taxi as the closing music. She's like, we're ready to close, Big Yellow Taxi, right? And so to this day, like, like, like Pavlov's dog, when I hear that song, I become so happy because it means that the surgery is over and I All can right. get out of the, yeah. So, so clearly surgery was not my calling. Um, so, <laughs> so it, it's so funny. Cause like every time I hear that, I just have this huge relief. It's over. And so for all the people out there who couldn't wait to get out of the OR, uh, <laughs> I recommend a Big Yellow Taxi by Counting Crows. That's reason enough to throw it into the playlist. Thank you very much. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Um, I don't do. Did you have time? Because one thing I did want to talk about was I think that what yeah. you guys are doing, you know, in terms of like the um, educational content that's being put out there in non-traditional forms, I think that that's something that, you know, I think is really game changing. It used to be that you wanted to give some education or put out information, you had to be involved in societies, you had to know people, you had to be invited. And, and the thing is that because it was so much about networking, it wasn't always about who was the best teacher, who had the best content, it was who knew who, who got invited by their friends. Mm -hmm. And I feel that now the thing that's really great about social media and the internet and Radiopedia is, do you have a great case? Put it out there. You know, everyone has a platform. Since I've been on social media, it's not the traditional people that you think of at big powerhouse institutions that are posting really amazing cases and putting out a lot of great teaching content. I mean, it's it's even residents who who have great Twitter pages with really interesting cases and really, you know, great teaching points that would never otherwise be able to, to have a voice. And I think that another thing is that because it was so society-based and it was much more Western societies, you know, that, that there was a lot of voice for a lot of the great experiences and a lot of great cases and a lot of the great pathology and teaching that comes from other places. And and I do think it's great that now they're, they're being able to, you know, have a, a platform. This is the kind of topic that Frank and I could talk about 
for hours with you. So maybe we should have you back on for a, okay. a panel discussion at some stage to talk about these kind of things, because yeah, we're, we're obviously very passionate about that. And, you know, it is wonderful to see, um, I like, I don't know what you were doing up until you started doing these tweets, but you know, you've really just through putting together these tutorials, you've really put yourself out there, uh, in a non-traditional way. And often that's not supported by, uh, academia. It's, I know that a lot of the stuff that I do is not really supported by even the hospital that I work at, um, you know, and, and so I think it's just really important for people like yourself to, to get in there and do it, even if it is the non-traditional means, because actually in reality gets to a whole lot more people than any of these, you know, niche meetings that, that happen and then no longer exist. Whereas a tutorial, uh, lives on forever. So keep at it and we will have you back to discuss these kind of issues again in the future. And awesome. be honest with me, how many times did I call you Leah instead of Lee? So, okay, this is going to be really bad. I don't even notice when people call me Leah anymore because like it, it, it just, it, it happens so often. And let's be honest, it's Leah. I'm the one who's <laughs> pronouncing it. I'm sure Frank will have a lot to chat with me about in the outro to this episode. So thank you so much. And I'll see you again soon. Okay. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. So much fun chatting to Lee. Definitely plan to have her back on the podcast very soon. That was amazing. Just a couple of really quick things from me before I get to you, Frank. Mm Mm-hmm. I want to just emphasize that that, you know, the name, the time you laugh, the hardest anecdotes, there's not supposed to be things that we're proud of, you know, obviously, um, pseudo seizures, psychosomatic conditions are really important and serious. And, you know, like the one that I told in the past episode, the, these are really stories about ourselves as young medical students in difficult or surreal situations reacting in ways that, you know, we know are inappropriate. Um, but they're part of the human experience, right. And part of developing as a young person. So I just wanted to say that we're aware of, of that. And the other thing I wanted to acknowledge is that clearly it takes more than two years at a community college (laughs) to become a radiology (laughs) technologist. Radiographers are, you know, very highly skilled and trained. You are, you are amazing. Unlike cousin Todd. (laughs) (laughs) Um, now Frank, you have a look on your face that says, I really enjoyed that, but I also have lots and lots of things to say, but I will say, uh, this has been a long episode already. So if you can just pick out a couple of quick things, that'd be good. Oh my God. There's so many. That was great. That was, uh, really interesting also to hear about the process of creating them, but okay. Let's get one out of the way first. And this is, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, pet hate or a goat as we, yeah, we call them goats. Yeah. <laughs> and that's uh radiologists who include named radiology signs in their reports. It's like fingernails down a blackboard. When someone, <laughs> when you read a report that says racing car ventricles <laughs> or yeah. bat shaped fourth ventricle or whatever it yeah, is, yeah. it's like radiology signs are there to help as a mnemonic, but you don't write it in your report. That's, yeah. um, Talk about it if you have to, but it's our personal little dirty secret, not something to be aired in front of clinicians and patients. All right. That's just a pet goat. That goat is trotting away. It's that's dealt with. So one of the issues that I think came up and was really well discussed is the issue of classifications. When you use a classification system, it's predicated on the fact that the person reading the report is familiar with it and uses the same one. And people get really wound up about which definition of moderate or severe is correct. So as a thought experiment, pretend that a good old Testament God, you know, gave you the correct classification for canal stenosis written on a tablet. Chiseled it out. It's still not useful unless everyone happens to have the same information. So it's not about whether it's right or wrong to call something severe or moderate. It's about whether you're communicating Mm-hmm. And I tend to not use grading systems except for when they're widely accepted and everyone knows exactly what you're talking about. Say Spetzer Martin classification of AVMs. That's great. Mm-hmm. It's named and it's, you know, firmly defined when it comes to canal stenosis, I really encourage my trainees to describe it enough so that someone can visualize it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's much more important than words like moderate 
or severe or grade one or, or whatever. I do think that idea that cord contact, distortion of the cord is kind of independent to the degree of overall narrowing of the canal was kind of the useful component mm -hmm. of this tutorial for me. It's kind of changed a little bit what I do in terms of emphasizing that side of it. Yeah, I think you can narrow a canal by 50% and still have lots of room for the cord. Mm. The The first few trials of carotid endarterectomy, one of them was the NASET. The one before that was ACAS or something. Uh, and it used to be measured from the outside lumen of the carotid artery. And so if you narrowed what the lumen of the bulb should be by 50%, you'd call it a 50% stenosis, even if what was left was still the same width as the artery mm -hmm. distal to it. And if you take a blood point of view, mm -hmm. the blood doesn't care how big nah. the lumen was on the outside. It only cares how big the lumen is that it's going through. And the cord is the same. If it's got room and it's surrounded by CSF, whether the canal is narrowed or not doesn't really matter uh, anywhere near as much as whether the cord is punched in the face. <laughs> <laughs> You like that analogy, the punch in the face? Yeah, I'm going to start using that in reports. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of analogies, I guess that's something else that I have um, strong but conflicted opinions on mm -hmm. because, and I struggled with a few of the analogies in, in some of Lee's work, uh, to be honest. Most of them I think are really useful because you take something that is complicated or difficult and by choosing the correct analogy, you can transfer your understanding of a different situation to this mm -hmm. new one. And so you get a lot of free knowledge. Yeah. If I was explaining to you that a particular material behaved like iron, then suddenly, you know, a whole heap of stuff about iron that you can transfer across. The problem with analogies is then they're, they're almost never perfect. And so in that transfer, you, you sometimes end up transferring incorrect intuitions. Mm -hmm. And that's when things are going well. I think there are some analogies where the thing you're trying to explain is just easier to explain directly than to try yeah. and come up with a complicated analogy. I know that I do that a lot. I quite like complicated, abstruse analogies. Uh, I don't know, bees and asteroids <laughs> last week. <laughs> just to pick something randomly. Yeah, bees. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly uh, free of this ill. I know exactly where you're coming from. Sometimes the analogies are, are a little stretched, but the overall quality of the teaching and the ability to communicate quite advanced topics, like th this one uh, wasn't a particularly advanced topic, yeah. but some of her tutorials are very advanced topics and she does manage to de-technicalize it down by using some analogies into something where you're actually communicating high level knowledge to advanced learners. Oh, no doubt. No, no. So these are great. This is not a, a criticism. It's more of a reflection on the way that I teach as well. And I think yeah. the other important thing is to recognize that not all learners learn the same way. And mm -hmm. so an analogy that you find stretched or difficult may be the thing that unlocks a particular understanding for someone else. And the same mm -hmm. thing is true with maths problems where you can approach it, you know, algebraically, you can approach it trigonometrically, you can approach it geometrically. And which approach you take can make it really simple and other approaches can be really, really difficult. And I guess analogies change your way of thinking about a problem by using different intuitions. I thought you were in your podcast room, not your mathematics room. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a different wing. That's in the east wing. Of Is the that house. an abacus in the background? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's wrap things up. How can people get in contact with us, Frank? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylard and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. And you can, of course, email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and feedback. And uh, if you want to help support Radiopedia, then you can become a paid sponsor via the website, or you can purchase an all access pass to our online courses and conference july radiopedia 2023 is coming up so make sure you register for that lee will be doing two talks one on brain Fantastic. tumors and one on uh how to teach with pictures don't forget that by registering or becoming an all access pass member you're actually supporting 125 low and middle income countries getting access to the conference completely for free and what else can people do, Francesco? And you can also help us out by leaving a five-star review in the podcast app of your choosing. All right, we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay right, everyone.
See you, mate. Go and tend Bye-bye. to your goats. <laughs> <laughs> My tribe of goats. <laughs> tribe. Bye. Mm.